and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. Welcome to Consider This. This is the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. As the world grapples with pressing environmental issues and the urgency to achieve sustainable development goals, the role of education in fostering a culture of sustainability has never been more crucial. How do we ensure that environmental and sustainable uh, sustainability education is integrated into all levels of formal and informal education efforts and that it involves students, teachers, administrators, all um, stakeholders within the ecosystem. Joining me on the show today to discuss this further is Dr. Subarna Sivapalan, who is the Associate Professor and Head of the School of Education at University of Nottingham, Malaysia. She's also the lead of the Malaysia Office for the UNESCO Chair in edu International Education and Development. And also we have Tan Hui Shim, who is the Associate Director of Strategy and Social Mobilization for WWF Malaysia. Welcome to the show, both of you. Thank, thank, you. thank you for thank being you, here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, so let's start the scene, uh, set the scene and maybe begin our conversation with you, um, Hushim, explaining maybe what, um, for our audience to better understand what Education for Sustainable Development entails. We call it ES, ESD, right? ESD. Uh, why is that important for us to take note of? Right. Well, um, first of all, I mean, uh, ESD, Education for Sustainable Development, right? So it's a key enabler for us to achieve the sustainable development goals. Mm. So, um, and it addresses the growing concerns, you know, as we advance as a society, um, there are all sorts of um, issues, mm. right? And how do we ensure we um, develop sustainably? Um, for Malaysia, because we are a mega biodiverse uh, country, so it's even more important that, you know, we embrace this um, education for sustainable development. Yeah. So, uh, is that roughly how you would define what ESD, how you understand ESD to be? Yes, uh, thank you, Melissa. First, <clears throat> thank you for having us uh, on your show. You're welcome. Uh, thank you so much for giving importance to this very important topic as well. Mm. Um, so, as Hushim said, you know, I, I, I don't dispute whatever she says. Yeah, we've been working very closely with mm -hmm. WWF for many, many years now. And I think we are all on the same line when we say that ESD is extremely, extremely important. Okay. Um, and why is it important? And beyond what Huishim mentioned just now, I think it is important because it has to become something that we embed in our daily lives. Mm. You know, it cannot be something that we just go to school to uh, understand and learn about, but it's actually beyond that. And embedding this as a value, embedding this as an attitude, embedding this as a behavior, it's why this is very important. Mm. And I think we are not talking about this enough. Okay. You know, uh, I'm not saying we're not talking about this at all, but we're not talking about this enough. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so where are we currently in terms of ESD in Malaysia? Um, could you elaborate as to the current status of it? Well, I guess, I mean, in a way, there are a lot of, um, um, how to say, I mean, a lot of different players or actors sure. in this scene, right? So right from the government, you know, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Youth and Sports, um, to NGOs, to schools, to um, civil society organizations, universities, you know, there are a lot of players. Mm. And we're all doing a lot of programs as well. So there are a lot being done, being offered, you know, to uh, whether students or youth, you know, from things like talks and events to competition to games, you know, like board oh, games okay. and e-games, you know, things like that. So there are all sorts of uh, uh, events and activities being organized. Um, Having said that, you know, of course, there are o there's always room to, to do more, mm -hmm. uh, to enhance. So um, um, I guess the challenges is, you know, like how do we bring all these players together mm. and work in a more cohesive manner, in a more coordinated manner and achieve bigger impact, have mm. better reach, wider reach and mm. deeper impact. Because yeah. what you're um, describing now seems to be kind of a mix of like formal, informal, like a mm. like a broad range of things. Um, so how do we think about the mm. the differences, um, the interplay between a more structured formal ESD and mm. the informal kind of um, outside the classroom? Mm. How, how does that mm. aware uh, awareness of sustainability mm. translate into understanding and most importantly action? Yeah. Mm. So I think that's a great question. Um, and for me at least, you know, personally, at a personal level, I think it has to start at home first. Okay. Yeah, everything starts at home. My daughter is 17 years old mm -hmm. and she's going to go into a world that's going to be increasingly uncertain. 
you know i think covid 19 taught us a lot of things mm. um, and those of us in the education sector i think we have been really impacted by the effects of covid so now moving forward you know we need to be thinking about how can we manage this better right more systemically mm. so you know you asked uh, Huishim just now about what the status is mm. you know of esd in this country i would say we are going in the right direction melissa yeah, so I've been fortunate because I've been working with great partners like WWF, you know, who recognize the importance of ESD. I'm an academic, okay. right? Uh, you know, we have this term called shock sindiri, right? <laughs> uh, I don't know how you translate that into English, but, you know, I think sometimes as academics, uh, we tend to be shock sindiri. I think that's a universal statement. Like, uh, <laughs> all languages will understand shock sindiri. <laughs> yeah, so the, the point I'm trying to make is, you know, as academics, as universities, right, we should be thinking about how we can create impact with the kinds of work that we do in the university. Mm. Um, as Huishi mentioned, there are lots of activities happening, but I think uh, what needs to be done better is we need to move out of being doing all these activities in silo. Mm. All right? okay. Universities, yeah, we have our KPIs, we want to achieve our KPIs, okay, let's do this. Right. Similarly, organizations, everybody is wanting to do something, wanting to contribute to the SDG targets, wanting to contribute to sustainable development, wanting to contribute to ESD. But how impactful is that? Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So going outside the silo, coming together, collaborating. Um, in alignment with what SDG, uh, SDG 17 is, right? Can, Partnerships. Can I just ask important. you, so uh, do we have elements of um, ESD within the national school curriculum? Okay, so I can answer that. Okay. So um, in the past one year and a half, I've been very fortunate to be on a uh, you know, national study. A few of us got into a national study uh, where we looked at the extent of the implementation of sustainability and ESD and environmental education within the primary and secondary curriculum. Okay. Okay. So we had about 2,000 respondents. WWF is also part of that work. Uh, Alam funded this work mm -hmm. uh, and all. And uh, we found it. Yes, yes, it is there. Okay. It definitely is there. Uh, but of course, like Kwishim said, we can improve. We definitely can improve. What we found in this study is that teachers are really up for, for it. You know, they want to go into the classroom. They want to do their best. They want to impart this knowledge of sustainability to their students. Mm. But, you know, uh, there could be a lack of capacity building for these teachers. Capacity building. Okay, I want yes. to come into that um, and bring uh, Huishim. The work that WWF Malaysia does um, within the space of ESD. So talk to me about a little bit about the legacy, the, the um, ethos of embedding um, education for sustainable development within n not just kind of um, formal settings, but also informal settings. Right. Okay. First of all, I mean, like, let me just um, say that. So WWF Malaysia has been uh, established in, in Malaysia um, for, since uh, 52 years ago. Oh, wow. So, and our education program have had seven, 47 years. So, you know, it's one of the longest uh, program that we have had. So, um, we have been working with uh, uh, schools and teachers as well as, you know, uh, a lot of uh, civil society organizations uh, in embedding um, uh, environmental education or education for sustainable development in all sorts of manners. So, uh, we have worked with um, um, the Ministry of Education in uh, developing modules uh, for teachers. Uh, we are currently working with uh, UPSI, University Pandidikan uh, Sultan Idris, uh, on developing an e-game uh, to promote uh, environmental awareness. Um, so there are all sorts of um, uh, approaches as well. And we also work with uh, youth groups. Um, so um, last year we, we supported several uh, youth-led organizations um, to organize, you know, whether it's forums and uh, mm. events or conferences and all that. So we partner with them uh, so that, you know, we can reach out to a bigger audience. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, just before we go any further, I have to clarify something. Mm. Education for sustainable development and environmental education, is that the same thing? Can we use them interchangeably? Is it? Is that because I noticed that you yeah. you mentioned yeah. environmental yeah, education yeah, yeah, yeah. as well yeah, as yeah. education yeah. for sustainable yeah. development? Yeah. 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 I'm not sure whether the academics would agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> For us, I mean, like, to me, I, I, I use it interchangeably. Okay. All right. I mean, like, in our context, because, I mean, I guess environmental education, uh, uh, to me, is very simply, you know, uh, uh, 
is education about the environment, mm -hmm. the, nature, the, the, the nature environment, in the environment, for the environment. And as an environmental uh, uh, conservation organization, I mean, that uh, uh, has been a key focus. Mm. Um, it has kind of evolved or expanded into education for sustainable development because we realize, you know, the, the scope is bigger. Right. So if you look at uh, the 17 sustainable development goals, I would say now, I mean, WWF Malaysia works on, I mean, our work contributes to half of those goals, at least, you know, so it's not just uh, environment, right. um, but it, it's, it's broader. I mean, it's, it's also talking about sustainable production and consumption. It's talking about um, uh, climate, you know, climate change is, is, mm. is a big topic, right? right? So climate change and biodiversity loss, you know, we, we call this the twin crisis of our mm -hmm. time. So how do we and uh, uh, capacity build our youth, you know, to uh, to be ready for these two crises? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I would use it interchangeably. Okay. Um, well, that, that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. And I think, I think it's all part of the building our knowledge around this, right? So, and, and not just kind of limiting mm -hmm. ourselves to just looking at environment in a yeah. certain way. Mm -hmm. You, Subhanam, uh, mentioned the need to build capacity amongst educators so that they can be kind of the multiplier effect uh, for the um, for ESD. T talk to me about maybe some of the efforts um, to achieve that, but also. What stands in the way? I mean, what do we need to um, address to ensure that we can scale up the capacity building? Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> capacity building, again, is not something, you know, we can just, you know, pass on to Ministry of Education. Right. It doesn't work like that, you know, and it shouldn't work like that, right? Um, so that's why we've got, you know, um, civil society organizations coming in. We've got universities coming in to offer support. So as I mentioned earlier, this need to work collaboratively is very important. Mm -hmm. So if I can just pan back to the national study findings, right? Sure. Um, so we found that, you know, teachers are ready. They, they, they welcome the idea of, you know, integrating sustainability, talking about the SDGs, talking about the climate crisis in the work that we do, uh, in the work that they do in the classrooms with their kids, but they also require um, training. Mm. They want training, right? So that's where we can come in, you know. Um, <clears throat> instead of just saying, okay, MOE, you need to come up with the module, you know, and train teachers. How sustainable is that in the long run, mm. right? So we come in together uh, and we form a coalition of sorts mm. and we move this agenda forward. I think that is a more sustainable way, a more sustainable model of how we can capacity build teachers, mm. yeah? Uh, challenges that come into the factor, I think we need to think about um, the geographic locations of teachers. Right. That's very important, right? You are talking about uh, being inclusive. So what about teachers in Sabah and Shrawak, teachers teaching in rural areas, and all, they should also be given equal access to these kinds of capacity building initiatives. So those are some challenges I think we need to be thinking about logistics, uh, readiness, you know, and who's going to train them. Right. <coughs> For sure, those are big questions. We're going to take a very quick break here and consider this. We will be back with more on this topic. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. We are discussing today the importance of education for sustainable development. And I'm joined by Tan Hui Shim, the Associate Dir Director of Strategy and Social Mobilization for WWF Malaysia, as well as Dr. Subarna Sivapalan, who is um, the Associate Professor and Head of the School of Education at University of Nottingham, Malaysia. I'm also going to add she's the lead of the Malaysia Office um, for the UNESCO Chair of International Education and Development. So I want to talk to you, Dr. Sparna, uh, picking up on what you said just before the break mm -hmm. about ensuring that ESD is inclusive. So it makes sure to capacity build among educators that are not just kind of peninsula-centric, but also include Sabasra as well. Mm -hmm. Education for sustainable development, just the concept itself, seems to be quite rooted in Western ideologies. And mm -hmm. it's in a concept that's quite Western-centric. How do we think about that in a Malaysia context to adapt um, and embed ESD in 
Malaysian context, a Malaysian perspective, so that it actually resonates with our cultural and societal values. Yeah. I think you've already answered the question also. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, yes, it is a very Western-centric uh, concept. Mm. Uh, not to say that it's not good, yeah. Uh, but I think the realities on the ground are very, very different. What's happening in a school in, in, the, in the UK or in Australia <coughs> may not be the same as what's happening in a school in Malaysia, mm. you know. Uh, and even within Malaysia, you know, what's happening in, uh, you know, an urban school like, uh, you know, uh, Kuala Lumpur. Right. Or a school in the interiors in Sabah and Sarawak, the realities are totally different, right? Mm -hmm. So imagine taking, you know, such complex concepts into teaching and learning in an, you know, you know in a very rural setup um, where you will probably also have teachers who are not familiar with, mm -hmm. with these issues and concepts. So I think the need to... Uh, uh, you know, make it local is very, very important. How, how do we do that? I mean, can you give me an example of okay. how we would make, what strategies would we use to adapt it to a local context? Sure. So can I give you an example of what we are doing at University of sure. Nottingham, yeah? Because we have a school of education and uh, we are preparing our students to become teachers. Of course. Right? So the narrative that, you know, we have developed in my school is that your class, you, uh, yeah, yeah, you're, you're going to become teachers, but you no longer need to confine yourself to the four walls of a classroom. You need to think about education as something that is beyond the four walls, right? Mm. If education is going to happen with impact, you need to be able to understand what the realities out there are. Mm. How are you going to become a teacher if you don't understand what the realities on the ground are? How are you going to be able to appreciate your indigenous students if you don't understand what their realities are on the ground? So taking the classroom outside is really very important. Um, so this is what we try and do in our school. Yeah. So um, so I became the head of school in May 2022, relatively you know uh, quite new. But the school has been um, you know around for a very long time. So the first thing I did was to tell everyone you know yes you are going to become somebody who is going to be in this field of education, yeah. but don't limit yourself to only going you know, and teaching in a school. Think about how you can use your superpower as a teacher to advocate change. And that's been well received? Very well received, okay. I hope. <laughs> what about you, Hushim? In your work with WLF Malaysia, yeah. I'm sure you've had yeah. to, to localize your outreach. Yeah. How do you do that? Right. Um, if I can just sort of uh, mm. uh, add in to a bit on, yeah, how do we localize this, right? Uh, I mean, the whole uh, sustainable development agenda, right? I mean, different countries have different pathways. Yeah. Malaysia is a developing country, so our pathway will be different from the Western or the developed countries, right? So in that sense, I mean, like, our education for sustainable development effort also needs to be different because our pathways are different, mm. right? Um, in terms of, uh, I mean, localizing um, uh, the ESD effort, I mean, I think a lot of it is about the, the content as well and our audience, right? I mean, as educators, I mean, like, we need to understand our target audience. Who are our target audience? What are their needs? Mm. What are their, how do we motivate them? Um, so um, can I give an example, sure. a, a story of, uh, uh, I want to tell you my penguin encounter. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. so I'm, Not in I'm, Malaysia. <laughs> yes, in Malaysia. Well, okay, I'm based in Kota Kinabalu, Sabah. So I was, uh, this is about a year ago, I was exercising in a local park. And then suddenly I heard a boy shouting, Mom, penguins! I was like, wow, penguin! Okay, so it's a little boy, you know, three or four years old. And then I look at where he's pointing. There was, there's a bird perching on the tree next mm. to a lake. It's quite big, it's about this size. And quite upright position. So uh, you, you, can't, you can't blame the kid for assuming, for it's assuming a that it's yeah. a penguin. But it's actually a black crown night heron. But how many of us have heard of black crown night heron? I can't picture it. Yeah. So it's quite a common bird actually oh. in Malaysia. Um, so the thing is, you know, like we we talk, we, we say we are a mega biodiversity country, but we actually don't know a lot about our local uh, animals mm. and plants. You know, and um, even common birds. You know, um, we a lot of. Uh, a lot of us mistaken, you know, uh, egrets as cranes, for example, you know, and and 
I, I guess I mean as parents, you know, like I mean I, I used to go to the bookstore a lot and buy picture books for my kids, and you see a lot of exotic animals. You know, like uh, the the toucan, the yeah, the polar yeah. bear, the penguins, and and all these things, and you don't often see Malaysian right. uh, animals being featured. So so most you know you could readily identify what a penguin looks like as opposed to a black crowned heron. night heron. Night heron. Yeah. I'm gonna Google that after we <laughs> finish the show. But just just to come back, follow on on your. Thank you for sharing that story. When we think about ESD, and I know Subana, you said at the start it should start at home. Mm -hmm. But if we were to think about it in a more formal setting, mm -hmm. when should it start? Yeah. Shall I take? This? Sure. Yes. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So. Um, as early as preschool. Wow. Yeah, as early as preschool. So, you know, I think another story, very short one. So I was in Sri Lanka many, many years ago and uh, we went into a temple and uh, I like exploring, you know, uh, things beyond the temple also sometimes. And there was a kindergarten happening, you know, just, just next to the temple, within the temple complex. Okay. And a science lesson was going on there and the teacher was talking about the weather, the teacher was talking about leaves and things like that. And then I start thinking about what my daughter did in preschool. Mm. You know, so these, these conversations are really important. Mm. These conversations are really important from very, very small, right? Because the realities of the future are going to be really, very, very different. And uh, what we want our children to have is this capacity to have environmental stewardship when they become older, mm -hmm. you know, and we don't see much of this environmental stewardship happening uh, in schools. It's not inculcated in schools as much as it should. Right. So probably now with the new, uh, you know, the, there's a revamp of the curriculum going to be happening, right? Uh, primary and secondary curriculum. Uh, we are hoping to see a lot more conversations about this appearing in the textbooks um, um, and all. Mm. So um, I I mean, there are some things I can't mention now because it is not confirmed yet, right. but I think we are heading there. Um, I think we are already heading there because I sit in, you know, meetings and I have conversations with key people in the ministry and I think we are heading there. Uh, Huishim is too, yeah. you know. Okay. So That we're on the right trajectory, <laughs> that we have some of the, we want to lay the right foundations. So yeah. you, you talked about how early it should start. and. So, but talk to me on the other end of the spectrum, the tertiary education oh, yeah. spectrum, because you think about the young adults yeah. who are about to graduate university and enter the workforce and, mm -hmm. you know, be, be prime candidates for environmental stewardship. These are the next generation of leaders. Yeah. Are they being engaged and um, inculcated with the kind of pro-environmental behaviours that we're hoping to see? WWF does a lot of work with youth, um, I know. So do, are you seeing that... Uh, being embedded within today's generation? Well, how should I start? I mean, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question. So I think the youth that we've engaged, or, you know, actually some of them come to us. Oh, you looking know, like, for something. Yeah, yeah, for they it. actually okay. come to us, you know, and say like they're organizing something and, and would like us to, you know, support them or be a speaker and all that. So there are some that are very engaged, mm. very motivated, and very inspiring. I mean, like, I how they work together, you know, uh, uh, collaborating, you know, and, and, and sourcing for uh, volunteers, you know, using yeah. social media and how they actually come together as a team to work on something is really inspiring. Um, so, so there are groups of youth who are very engaged, uh, uh, very motivated. But on the other hand, I, I don't think this represents the whole okay. youth population. So I guess our task is how do we scale this up you know, so that more youth are engaged. Mm. And as you say, you know, as, as uh, young professionals, as they enter into the workforce, um, they are going to be the future leaders. And, and now that, you know, we talk about uh, uh, ESG, Environment Social Governance, mm. right? And it's across the board. I mean, like it affects the, the, the corporate, you know, all sectors and all industries. So if, what if, you know, all these youth, when they join the workforce, they already have this uh, uh, sustainability literacy and they can bring that change to the uh, place they work and you know to, to transform the, the, the whole 
you know, all the industries. I mean, that, that would be a, a vision that we would like right. to see, of course. Yeah. Sustainability, literacies and competencies, right? Yeah. yeah. Can I just add on sure. to what Wishim said? Because I am in higher education, so, yeah. you know. <laughs> yes. um, and, you know, I think what Wishim said just now is really very important. The students are going over to them to seek for, for mm. additional knowledge. So is this a good thing for us in higher education? Yes, they're hungry for it, Exactly. Right? Yeah. So are we, are we doing enough? Mm. You know, so the question is, are we doing enough? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, traditional courses like engineering, for example, it is a given that you need to be speaking about all these things mm -hmm. because you cannot have engineers going and building bridges uh, without thinking, without thinking about, about sustainability. Absolutely, right. Yeah. absolutely, right? Um, so we need to do more in higher education. I so, cannot say this enough. Oh, well, well, can I then follow up on that? In the couple of <laughs> minutes that we have left, sure. um, in an effort to do more, I think uh, collaborative partnerships, yes. stakeholder partnerships are key. And it, both of you are testament to that, working yeah. together for so many years. How would you like, um, how can we leverage upon stakeholder partnerships to scale up this, these efforts? Yeah. yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, Melissa, you work in silo, you're not going to create impact. Mm. I can go in as university representative and I say, see, I've got this great research, you know, um, let's implement this great research. Mm. but it's, it's not going to go anywhere. If I go with Wishim and I say WWF is here, university is here, uh, ministry is here, schools are here, teachers are here, students are here, you're going in together as one voice, that's where you can see impact. Mm. So that is why collaborations and coalitions like this are super important. Right. Wishim? Yeah. yeah, if I may add to that, so I, I think what we, we are trying to see the whole ecosystem mm -hmm. for ESD. So it's an ecosystem, right? I mean, uh, Dr. Subana just outlined like all the different players, but there's also policies and processes and resources and, and you know, all the things that needs to mm -hmm. make an ecosystem work. So we're trying to look at this as an ecosystem. How can we make the ecosystem uh, more resilient, more cohesive, um, have bigger impact? Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of uh, view that we are taking. Right. Thank you both for sharing your insights on the show and for the work that you do. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's all we have for you on this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris signing off for the evening. Thank you so much for watching. Good night. <laughs>